lost track of how many seminars we've had this season already, uh, maybe eight or nine. Uh, but our speaker today is Paul Aspel. He's joining us to talk about the gem upgrade for the CMS experiment at the other two. So, Okay, so good afternoon. And uh, I'm happy to say it, so I'm concerned. And uh, one thing that uh, we're good at the CERN is doing cartoons. So we start with this nice introductory cartoon. The uh, LHC, the superconducting magnets, gliding protons inside experiments, collecting data and shipping it out to the data and since this is a nice uh, cartoon from, from CMS, this is meant to be CMS. And uh, then this is a more detailed cartoon of CMS. Um, but this, this is as CMS is for the phase one period of operation, which is what CMS was designed for. So it was designed for operating with the instantaneous luminosity of uh, 10 to the 34. And, um, Already, as you all well know, um, some th things have already been seen, which are which are quite pleasing, such as the boson. So, in order to go on to the end of uh, in the, the end of the phase one, the, it's intended to increase the luminosity up to around two times ten to the thirty-four, and to deliver a total. Uh, integrated with the luminosity of about 300 femtoparts, which is 10 times or so more than we have at the moment. So you would think that that would be sort of enough, but it seems not. And what they would like to do is to go into phase two. So what they would like to do is to go to this high luminosity phase of, of LHC, increasing the instantaneous luminosity another uh, to 5 times 10 to the third floor, gathering an extra 2,500 in the center of data over another 10 years. So within a detector that was designed just for this phase one, then all of these detecting elements, which are silicon and which are gas detectors and also scintillating crystals and some other mediums there, these all degrade with the radiation and also the same is true for, for, the, for the electron. And so, so many of them will not survive into phase two and need to be replaced. Now in addition to that, because of the increase in velocity, we have a lot more particles to, to try to detect and understand. And uh, this, this comes from just the, the amount of particles um, there and also due to increased pylon. So the demands of the high velocity phase are in one is to try to understand the vertexes more precisely in the pileup situation where you have many vertexes uh, in a single uh, bunch crossing. And also to have more advanced triggering. And this means that we don't only need to replace these detectors, we need to put in new detectors and we also need to make smarter electronics to do a more uh, impressive job than the first round of electronics. So this is what's going on at the moment with the different uh, subdetectors. All the subdetectors are evaluating their own detector systems, see what needs to be replaced and what needs to be upgraded. And this talk covers one particular part of this upgrade, which is the gem upgrade for, for CMS. So this is the, the flow. So I'm just uh, going to introduce a little bit uh, uh, the story and why we use gems, and then go on to look at a key element, which is the front end part of the electronic system, then go through the DACs and then look at the system side of it and, and close. So the GEM project, here, here you see the um, a quarter of CMS. And what we know is we know the silicon tracker, oh, this needs to be uh, replaced. Also in the forward regions, this calorimetry part, we know the crystals there will, will uh, not survive uh, or not work well in uh, phase, phase, phase two. So there are, there are studies being looking on there. On the whole, the muon system is in relatively good shape. Um, although in this forward region here, which is the most demanding region, then there are some uh, 
uh, changes uh, foreseen. And this is where we start to think about putting in germs. So the first part is to put in this region here, which is the G11 region. And the idea is to put a ring of uh, gem protectors that sit just in front of CSD protectors. And this is foreseen to go in in us too, which is before the end of phase one, and it's to, to, to help, help the triggering as this luminosity increases as we approach phase two operation. And then there are other detecting regions. So there's this region here, which is the G21, which again sits in front of uh, CSC detectors. And we have this region, ME0, which covers a very high eta region. Of, of, this, uh, of, 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 of this here, which wasn't covered before. So this actually sits in what is the sort of back end of the, the HK region. So this is a slide from, from Alexier, and uh, it's one of the main reasons why, uh, why we plan to put the gen detectors just in front of the CSCs. So the reason is you get extra points, so you get, uh, data, you get data points of muons in the CSCs, and then if you combine this at the trigger level with points that you get in the gem, then you can, you, you can then determine the bending angle and uh, the momentum of the particular muon, which enables the triggering process to be more selective and to, to really select the, uh, the momentum that uh, is required for the particular uh, trigger. So now I'm going to spend a little bit of a few slides talking about gem detectors and explain what they are. So why do we use gems? Well, gems offer the high point resolution which is needed. Um, so they offer uh, operation at very high particle rates and that's important particularly in this high inter region. It's a, a new gas detector technology, but it's not that new. So it's been around for some years, and uh, manufacturing techniques are, uh, are, de are developing going on at the moment, and they're now looking at how you do large-scale production of, of these kinds of uh, uh, detectors. And so the manufacturing process is well understood, and they also offer good uh, radiation uh, uh, tolerance. So a gem detector, looks a little bit like this. So you have a, a gas volume, and um, this volume is divided up into different regions, which are called the drift, transfer one, transfer two, and induction. And they're separated by three gem foils, which are foils uh, like, like this, which are um, uh, developed from normal PCB manufacturing techniques. And uh, you basically have a copper on a on sheet with lots of, lots of holes. Then as you have a charged particle tra traversing this volume, you have ionization happening uh, in, the, in the whole volume, but the, the important region is this grid. So there we have electrons and holes created. And if we look, uh, we, can, we can look up um, in the physics tables, the number of primary uh, ionizations that go on for different gas mixtures. And, and the gas mixture that uh, we're currently using is either argon CO2 or argon CO2 CO4. So if we look at these, you can, you can calculate for this, uh, this region that you're going to end up with around 42 uh, primary electrons, which then have some knock-on effects and then produce a, a total of a region of around uh, 107. Um, electrons uh, within, within a centimeter, which gives you around 32 electrons over a three millimeter gap. For what energy particle? Uh, for KeV, is that for K KeV? KeV, what is it? It's a muse. Minimum So now this 32 electrons, now we can compare that with silicon here. So with 300 microns, of silicon, you get around 22,000 electrons. So there's a huge difference in the, the signal that's provided from from the emitter. So this one, on its own, would not be very useful. So it has to have amplification, and that's where these 
these gem foils come in. So these, these gem foils are biased. Um, uh, here you can see the, the, an example of how they're biased to produce very intense electric fields across these, these gem foils. And what happens is your uh, electrons from the primary ionizing uh, prim primary ionization drift in the, in the electric field towards the gem foil and the ions drift towards the cathode. Then they're swept into this uh, region here. You have a, an avalanche process taking place and you have um, an approximate amplification of a factor uh, 20 uh, giving electrons ejected here with some electrons being uh, recovered on the other side of the gem foil. Now this happens three, three times. So once you do that three times, you can first order say that you've got around an 8,000 amplification. So that, if we take our initial 32 uh, electrons, that now gives us an amplification up to around 256,000 electrons or 41 femtocoulombs of, of charge. And this is coming down as a cloud, so there's also some diffusion laterally as it, as it drifts. And so we can make a sort of an estimate that this is going to fall onto a number of different strips, and then we can make some kind of estimate of the amount of charge falling on, on different strips. Uh, I have a question. The electron that drifts, it's going to take a certain amount of time by the time you go into the sequence. Um, pile up within the gem yeah. detector. So um, I'm. We do not have in uh, the rates right. when you have really like one avalanche right. to the other avalanche. So I've seen. A, of the the I've seen a presentation by Rob Benoff, who uh, does all of these kind of studies. And he, he's, he's looked at uh, the kind of what happens in, in these regions here with very high rates. But you do have to go to rates which are much higher than we're doing in order to have um, properties going on here which really disturb. So one question I always have is why don't you think it's a silicon which gets damaged with radiation you can more expensive and last a long time. You don't have to reinvent the yeah, it's a new system. It's I know it's large. It will be very expensive. It's so in terms of speed, which uh, so that's also very important from an electronics perspective of understanding the signal is is how we collect this, the time it takes to collect this signal. So from first, uh, first of all, what I wanted to do was to just understand how we collect the charge. So we, there, there, this is a table of uh, drift uh, velocities of the different types of gases with different fields. And uh, what we can see is the induction region, which is here. So the, the drift time to go through this induction region is in the order of 10 nanoseconds. And the electronics sits on an electrode just here. Now the first the electronics knows, sees as a signal, is the induction as an electron leaves this, this third gem foil here. So what it sees is a buildup of charge over around 10, 10 nanoseconds. And then there's one would assume some kind of plateau, which is given by the drift time in the drift region, as because this all follows through, and then after that's done, then it collapses so again around 10 nanoseconds, and this is working out those those, those times there. So it's actually pretty short. Then we do a bunch of courses, 25 milliseconds, and come up with that. Another one, then we do a bunch of courses in radiation. Okay, it still hasn't cleared the case for 15 nanoseconds. If it would be 
just like that, it wouldn't be so bad. In actual fact, it, it's, a, it's messier than that. So these are measurements taken a long time ago of signals from Jimmy detectors. And what, what you see is actually, it's very lumpy and unpredictable. So this is, this is what one would nicely assume would be like that. And it comes in this kind of lumpy fashion. Is that because of the image charts first? So what's, although I can't say for absolute, with 100% uh, confidence, what I think it's due to is, is the uh, statistical, in, in here you only have, a, you, you, you have sort of clumps of ionization going on from statistical process, right? And I think it's these clumps which are, are drifting through. And then they get they get amplified by the different stages. That um, that's what I believe it's believe it's from. But your pulse is mostly from the gen three to the nut three nut. That's the main pulse. If you can have book I mean, it, uh, uh, I don't know maybe you could do previous page. So uh, you mentioned it. Uh, I mean, normally most of the time it should the ionization should happen in drift water. But it can also happen in transfer between transfer one and transfer two. So you mentioned it happens I don't know, in transfer one. So the signal will come through there compared to ionization and drift. Right, but it's much smaller. Yeah, but the charge is much smaller than the one in drift. I mean, if we will, if we will, uh, then it's only a factor of 20 on average. Right? Yeah. 20, yeah. Yeah, because you know, the total amplification is 20 to the third power. Yeah. Uh, but then uh, it also depends on I mean, the process probabilistic. You, know, you can have more uh, you know, electric ionizations uh, happen uh, less and you know, I think you know, these are not very, these are just example, right? It's not that uh, every 50% of the time you get these two structures. It happens in time. But um, you, you don't, I mean, these are three different samples. So what you get is an unpredictable lumpiness. Right, yeah, but you know, I think you know, the type that's at the top is happening pro probably fairly rarely, right? Because uh, I mean, looking at the times, it looks like one happens in one ionization, and then there are two ionizations happening in two different places. And then uh, you know, the probably rarely are that big. Yeah, rarely it happens in this box that you take. But if you look at some of these other ones, you can see that the pulse height, you know, you get some pulse height that's smaller, and still most of it comes in over here. Just that you have to deal with all of them. What is the drift velocity of electrons in this? So this is this here you have the. So how long does it take to get to one? Twenty nanoseconds. Well, it's some numbers, tens of nanoseconds. Yeah. So if you go to the next plot, I think what would be happening in the year Gen three, when it gets, you said forty percent of the electrons actually captured. The, the signal, 60% get through it, 40% get stuck in the, uh, you know, the gen 3. And that's going to induce an image on the induction. Okay? And that has to lead to a signal, which will come earlier than the electron going in and causing a second event. Right? Right, so that has to be, it has to be held, I think, okay, except how much is the larger height. Because we do, we do the same technique in our technique. There's an image charge first, and then the electron. That's why I think a double peak with different levels is a, is a usual phenomenon. Yeah, but those two bumps that are 40 nanoseconds apart, you know, those have to come from two different organizations, the difference in times. Because it, it is too big, you're saying that it is. They look like pretty much 30, 40, 30 nanoseconds apart. Well, I think, you know, the others, you know, that are closer, maybe, you know, that, that this example charge in the top, Probably two ionizations happen in uh, two I don't know, groups of uh, coming from two ionizations in different regions. Yeah. Just, just looking at the very large time difference. Um, right. So that's the gem detect part. Now we'll start to look at the, the electronics. So this is a block diagram of our 
our electronic system. And uh, so here we have the, the, the front end chip. This here is the, the gem detector, which is segmented into, into heater and into fly. And in each of these areas, it's further segmented into 128 strips running vertically here. And so we have one front end chip, which is connected to these 128 strips. And that communicates through a jet board, so not a hybrid board, that then sends signals out via fiber optics, one to the CSCs and also out to, to the micro TCA. So let's have a look at these components, and we, we start with the front end uh, part of the, the design. So we start with VFAT2, since this was a, a chip that um, already existed. So I worked on this uh, a number of years ago with uh, these other designers here. And it was developed for the totem experiment. And it was used with gem detectors. Here you have gem detectors, uh, gem telescope uh, for the totem experiment. It was also used with CSCs and it was used with uh, silicon detectors. So this is one silicon detector with four VFAT2 chips connected to it. And the functions of VFAT2 are that it's used for both uh, triggering and tracking. In other words, triggering is it provides fast, fast all signals, um, synchronous with the bunch crossing, so you can determine if there are hits within the chip, and tracking to read out the full granularity of data after level one. So this is the architecture. So you have 128 channels, bring up fire shaper, followed by a comparator. Then you go from the analog asynchronous world into the digital synchronous world. We have two memories here, SRAM1 and SRAM2. SRAM1 is essentially 128p. It samples on every bunch crossing, the data coming from the comparators, and it runs in a, a loop. Then on getting a first level trigger, it then selects the column which is corresponding to that trigger and it puts the data into SRAM2 and it adds to it time tags to build data packets that can, can then be read out. And at the same time you have a trigger path which goes from here which gives the fast all signals. So that is really what we want for this system except that uh, we can't use the same chip. We have to do another chip. And these are the, the reasons for that. So um, the VFAT2 has a trigger granularity of 16. It has a fast OR of 16 channels. And we need increased granularity uh, compared to that. The shaping time is fixed at 25 nanoseconds. And we would like for the, uh, the next version to have a programmable shaping time so that we can operate over the full charge collection time. Because VFAT2 uh, will suffer from a ballistic deficit and just catch the leading edge of that charge. So the data output here is limited to 40 megahertz, and we would like this to be compatible with the GPT chip, which has been developed for readouts. So, so sorry, you have one question. The programmable shaping time, is that an adaptive? Shaping time depending on how much energy you have, or is it a fixed one for each unit? Uh, it's it, there will be it's quantized levels. Um, uh, I'll show it in another slide in a moment. So the level one latency uh, of CMS that was designed with the design value. Um, was 3.2 microseconds, and we in DFAT2 we put it up to 6.4 microseconds. But it's the level one latency for, for the high luminosity phase is expected to to increase up, in, increase a lot. And the early suggestions were that it might even go up to as much as 20 microseconds. So we're actually building um, to to go beyond that for our next year. And the level one rate for VFAT2, it was designed to work um, at 200 kilohertz to satisfy the CMS spec for the 100 kilohertz uh, Poisson. And here we need to, to go up to, probably not up to one megahertz, but that was the initial idea, and that we're designing such that it can be used uh, at one megahertz rates. So this is the chip that we're designing now, which is VFAT3. You can see it has 
an architecture which is very similar to the fact two. You have 128 channels with pre-amplifier shaper discriminator, and we have the SRAM one, SRAM two, and so on. So it looks all very similar at this level. We have the trigger outputs here, and we have the data after level one going through the COM port here. Now let's go back to the detector signal. So this, these are Garfield simulations done in Brussels, uh, where they where they simulate the the charge going through the detector, and you can see the lumpiness also coming through 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 here. Now with VFAT2, VFAT2 has been used with these detectors in test beams, and it's uh, it it works very well, and it has very good timing resolution. This timing resolution is an important parameter for this project. And um, but because it just reacts basically on the front edge, it means that we lose the full integration of charge, and we could be losing the signal to noise ratio. So what one of the ideas is to integrate fully the charge here. But then if we do that and we put it into a discriminator, then time warp will mean that we lose time and resolution. So we're looking at ways of trying to have the best of both worlds. So, so you mean, it, it, split into two. One is the leading edge providing the timing. The other one would be integrated and produce an energy. Right, a full integrated yeah. Yeah. Well, um, VFAC 2 gives you, so we, we don't read out energy. Just read out hit or no hit it's a, in this system. It's a binary system. Um, but what essentially we're losing signal if we have a ballistic deficit. So it means that uh, our signal to noise ratio could be better if we would allow it to have more signal. So starting the process, so this is just some um, uh, simulations done. Um, where you take that signal coming from from the simulator and then integrate it with the with the front end, and we looked at two different techniques to compensate for time walk. One which is called time over threshold, and one using the constant fraction discriminator. And both of these allow you to, in principle, compensate for the time walk and get back to good uh, timing resolution. These two techniques were compared in this, this chart here, and this is for different shaping times, and they both more or less uh, give the same, same result. So we should expect, by using one of these techniques, to, to have something uh, around 5 nanoseconds or, or a little bit better. And um, because CFD is the most efficient in terms of uh, design resources, Time over threshold would need a lookup table within the chip, which is a bit more demanding. So this is the approach that uh, we followed. So we had two different design groups, one based uh, in Paris, who started to look at a, a front-end design. So that these are the characteristics that uh, they were building in. So this would have programmable shaping times of 25, 50, 75, 100, and 200 nanoseconds and we program all the game. Now, you were asking about, this doesn't change automatically, this is programmed. So we, we essentially do this during the setup phase of the chip. Uh, we, can, we, can choose, we can select any one of these. Uh, um, and you can also do as needed for the change. And another group in, in Bari were looking at the constant fraction discriminator. And two chips, uh, test chips, were submitted earlier this year. And um, they, they should have received these chips back now, and they should be busy testing them. But I don't have any results for you yet. But the results from, from that should confirm or not this hypothesis of trying to correct for time resolution if we integrate charge further. So on the digital side of it, we have two different parts. This is a variable latency part, and the, the other part, which is the trigger, is a fixed latency part. So in the variable latency part, what we want to do is we want to have data packets that come from VFAT3 uh, and go to the micro-TCA, 
which should be, it should contain all the data that's necessary to determine the event. Um, but it shouldn't contain too much data because otherwise we suffer with the, the rates. And then from the micro TCA to the CMS, here, here the uh, size of this data packet can be, can be much larger. So what we've done is with, we're designing the BFAT3 such that it has programmable data packets. And this means that um, uh, at the early phase we can put in a lot of information and as we, we go into higher rates we can do more work in the micro TCA part of housekeeping of the events and reduce the amount of information that goes into this data packet. And we have a lot of programmable options. And certainly not going to go through, through them, but you'll, all of them, but you'll get a basic idea. So a data packet looks like this. You have a header, you have some time tags, you have the data, and then you have a CRC check at the end. And this is with a lossless uh, data, which means you have a zero or a one for every channel uh, within the chip. And so we have programmable uh, durations of time tags. And we can also say whether we want it to zero suppress or not, since most of the chips in the system will actually contain no data most of the time. Then we can choose we can choose such that this field is suppressed, and we just send out a packet like this, just containing the time tags so that we don't lose synchronization. And another way is uh, this particular format data format, which is SPZS, and what this is, is it's a sequential pattern uh, whereby we divide up the 128 channels into groups of, um, into groups of, uh, of uh, eight, and which we call partitions, and then we go through a se sequence, and a zero means there's no hits in that particular partition. So if we have 16 zeros, then they've got no hits in the chip. If we go through and we get one hit, we get one here for partition four, then we then send out the data for partition four. And then this is, um, it becomes lossy after the maximum number of partitions that you're allowed to be hit. And we also add that as a programmable parameter. Now in the fixed latency path, then we also have options here. We have the option to send out fast all, which is in pairs of chips. Essentially, this is because we have eight outputs here, which are S output less pairs. They all run at 320 megabits per second, which gives us 64 bits per bunch crossing. So if we have 128 channels, fast all of two channels will use up all the bits here. So we can send this out synchronously um, every bunch crossing. We also can choose to put the SPZS structure in here which means that we would be able to send out six partitions in full granularity for bunch crossing. Or we can choose to use DDR, which is a double, double data rate, which means that we can send bits on each clock edge, which means here we can send out, um, here we can send out the full granularity on the 320 megabits per second. Then there is a communication port here, and what's different about this and the previous chip is here we send all of the communication to the chip via this port. It's a bi-directional port, so we put all of the slow control through this port, and all of the fast control signals, and all of the data packets that are read out. that all go through this port. And uh, this design has been done by uh, uh, one of my students, uh, Micek, and he's actually uh, got a paper on that next week at uh, TWEP, just on this port here. So now moving through to the DAC design. So again, there's the uh, system, and we can redraw that system like this, where you have the front end chip, here you have the control path and the readout path of the variable latency. And these are these go through GBT chips, which then go through to the micro TCAs. And here we see the trigger path that goes to a concentrator chip, which gathers the trigger bits from all of the front ends. It then um, does zero suppression within the, within the chip here and sends both out to the micro TCA and to the TMB of uh, the CSCs. So we have the DFAT chip is, can, is uh, mounted on a hybrid. Here you see the hybrid. 
And this hybrid is designed such that it plugs into the gen board, as you can see in this, uh, this drawing here. And it plugs through, so this plugs into the gen board, and there's a hole in the gen. This is gen electronics readout board. So the signals to the chip go through this board here, and also the power into the hybrid, and here's your chip here. The cooling will go on the on this side of the chip of the board here. So this is um, the, this, these hybrids, and also the jet board was uh, designed by this guy here, who's a PhD student uh, working in Lappenrantha in Finland. So here you see him modeling next to uh, the, the, the jet board. And the Octo hybrid board, which gathers all the data from all the chips and uh, provides the, the, the link between the Octo links and the signals going in the jet, is the Opto hybrid, and this is being designed by Ethan Mann in Brussels. So here you see the version one of that board. Uh, now I mentioned the GBT. We don't have oh, the GBT. Can I interrupt you for a second? Can you show again the gel? So uh, for uh, station two, there would be a ledger, right? But it would be cold, basically, or it's several parts of it will be for, for G21. Yeah. It's, going to, it's going to have to be several parts put together. There's no way this can be manufactured as one piece. This is already the limit of what can be done from what we've seen with uh, the industrial parts. Yeah, where are the dimensions that's there for? I forget it. So. This, this is a, this is, it's approximately a meter. I mean, it's, it's good as good so as. It's a meter long. I mean, it's a meter long, and this is half, half a meter wide, and it's uh, wide as well. Uh, six. Six. Yeah, that's bad, that's six. Six. <laughs> so, have you guys found making this board? Well, the, the, the first ones were done in China, and another uh, another batch has been launched to the same company. But they they started putting a price there. <laughs> well, they won't be from the mistakes, you know. So. <laughs> uh, they've actually increased it quite quite a bit, and so well. Jason actually also did some investigation in the US to see how much this would be to be done in the US. And it's a lot more expensive in the US than even this increased price in China. So, but this is this is a concern because this is going to be a major cost point actually. Okay, now GBTs. So the GBT is a development going on in, in CERN. Uh, it's aimed at many of the subdetector uh, systems for the high-intensity phase of the LHC. So here, here you see, this is the GBT uh, chip, basically, and then you have um, you have the optical uh, receivers and uh, transmitters here, and then you hang a bunch of uh, front-end chips on, on the front here, and it can, it can receive up to 10 front-end chips with a link here of three, 320 megabits per second and th uh, a data link a data bandwidth of 3.2 gigabits per second here, although it's actually running at 4.8 gigabits per second. Now the design of this has been done. Here you see some prototype chips. Uh, and the, uh, the, the production of this has just has been launched now. So we, we hope to get a few samples perhaps by the end of the year. And, uh, and these will be delivered out to the different experiments. So we should expect to see next year some some GPT, some GPTs working with different groups. Yeah, they so they've tested in the in the lab. So they found some issues. Well, they they've had a few few iterations of this. So there is uh, so we expect that they, this one will be issues Yes, although they had to launch the production earlier than foreseen. Because this is because of um, this is in IBM 130, and IBM has put their foundry up for sale, and it's not known who's going to buy it. And uh, so, for this project that was very close to the end, this was a big concern for them. So they were forced to go launch production immediately before it's too late. I think that happen all the time. Foundry said stop 
learning process also is a big, big headache. A ASIC design is a walk in the park. But I have a question about this. Uh, did they do any radiation tolerance studies with the ship? I mean, yes. it's supposed to be rather hard, but I don't yes. know. Yes. Well, well, basically, rather hard. This is a universal rather Yeah, no, but I wonder if they tested it. I mean, I've yes, never heard no, of it. I don't have results here to show, so maybe there will be checked next week in the I think there should be something. Yeah, I'm going to go over the stops. So there on the back end side, so we have micro TCA crates which house AMC modules and uh, these collect essentially the, the optical fibers plug into these. So far we're using a board called the Glib and in the future we intend to use a board which is uh, related to a design called the, the MP7. And here this can, can handle a lot more links than, than the clip. But we may be able to buy one. So yes. we're waiting for the money to come to the US. Yeah, it's, it's, there's an MP7, an MP7, an yeah. MTF7, and so the CMP7. Yeah. The CMS is all these different words, yeah. they're all very similar. That's right, and here you can see what a micro TCA crate looks like, and uh, this is the. Uh, this keeps going off. Um, here you can see the, the AMC boards that plug in, and there's also an AMC board and an MCH, which are boards that have already been developed and uh, operating uh, well, I believe. And this is a photograph just in 904 of 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 that crate with these two boards or boards in. Yeah, that's our development test stand. Sorry? Our 904 is our development test stand. That's our, yeah. Some people are done that. <laughs> so going, going on to, to um, pro, uh, prototyping. So we're going to go through a series of prototype steps to get to this final, to the final architecture. And this is our first prototype. So we have a, we have a prototype where everything is called one, and then we have another prototype where it's called two, and everything called three. So we have um, uh, for prototype one uh, and prototype two, this is using the BFAT2 chip, and prototype three is intended to use the final chip, BFAT3. So we have uh, the first version of a jet has been, has been done, and it uses the first version of the Opto hybrid. And this is essentially to do initial electronic tests on these different components. And then we have a version two, which is currently, most of these are in production, um, where we have, we'll be able to read out 24 front end chips, going through an Opto hybrid, and have the communication uh, to the front end, everything there, with the goal that this can be used in test beams, uh, in certain cosmic stands and also a prototyping system that will go into CMS, which we call the slice test. By the way, we're programming optically from micro to see, so we can figure out how we need to be controlled safely so we can move to the slice test. So we're more concerned about the uh, safety of control. Uh, it's still, I mean, it's still. Yeah, we're only installing a few chambers. I thought we had a, a, a option there. So for a few chambers, just have a copper cable for a boot strap for the two chambers. Which is the final design we have the DBT, which is rather hard and yeah. stable. But in so the interim, is it possible we have to do copper? Yeah, our plan is to have a copper cable there. So remember, during the slice test, those gym chambers aren't mission critical. We want to do tests with them. Yeah, correct. If they're losing the you know, fours, I know. But no, the, the point is, though, is where we have the failures, I think we're going to upgrade the firmware. I think that's always the big, the big problem. If, you, if, if something goes wrong during loading the firmware, now you have a board that's not programming, and you're programming the DBT. So if that ever happens, we have this bootstrap copper cable just to recover the programming for upgrades. I mean, it's a development system. It's going to be upgraded. Yeah, but, you know, this, this copper will be good. It's going to be, actually, we think it's going to be a pigtail as things to where we can go to the laptop. Oh, yes, you will. Yeah, there are lots of times you can walk around the computer. 
I mean, not going to be a really heavy day. No, no, there'll be a piece of work. It's, it's, it's coming up to near the, where we can access it. Oh, so the point is it just be the wire that you can Yeah, just, to, just for programming. It's just for reprogramming in case the program that fails. It's a backup. It's a backup where we can get emergency access if we need to it. And it's not, it works because we don't have two chambers and it's not mission critical. It would never work in the final system. The slice testing can work until we get the GPTs. We made the GPTs that are at hard, they're stable, yeah. we're not going to lose the links. There, there is still the possibility of having GPTs ready for that time. We'll, yeah. we'll see how it goes. Yeah, you just mentioned they were going into an earlier submission. Uh, uh, earlier, better. Obviously, if we need the GPTs for that too, that, that resolves the issue as well. So here you can see um, uh, the development stage as it is at the moment. This is with prototype one. We have again the Octo hybrid. It's a front end hybrid. And at the moment, they're developing firmware and software to be able to try and get the system running. Uh, prototype two, the system will look uh, like, like this, which is intended for the uh, slice test. To put in a couple of chambers, a couple of super chambers into the system and run parasitically to the rest of the CMS. And there we have the final system. Now we have final systems are needed for G11, G21, and ME0, and there are just subtle differences between these. So this is what the question that Alexia asked. So G21 covers a larger, each chamber is intended to cover 20 degrees. And so that means that these chambers are going to be very large, so we have to work out how, how to do that. ME0 often operates at much higher particle rates and also radiation. So we'll have to see how we deal with the, the bandwidth there and also um, uh, whether we uh, use an FPGA in that region or whether we put a dedicated AC in the ME0 region. And the other thing is that since this is for phase two, there will be another version of GPT called the LBGPT, uh, which is being developed for that, that time, which has twice the bandwidth of the present uh, GPT. So we we'll this time. It's yes. Yes. What LP stands for? Sorry? What LP stands for? Low power. Um, in fact, you have a choice. You can, you can run it at the same speed as now with low power, or you can run it with twice the speed and consume it with So for, for the trackers, they'll use the low power side of it. Now this, this I'm, not, I'm not going to go into too many details. This is my second to last slide. But we've also, looking at the moment, about the data bandwidths that's needed for G21, ME0, checking that we're not going to saturate uh, with, with the rates that are expected in these regions. And um, what uh, the, the simulations are, are looking pretty pretty good at the moment, particularly once we zero suppress data, then everything is looking, uh, looking fine. So one thing I want to just say before finishing is that um, this project, it actually is not a CERN project as such. There's very few, there's, from the engineering side, there's only myself working on this who's a CERN staff. And everybody else comes from institutes all over the world. Uh, and it's master students, it's PhD students, and, and collaborators. So here, here you see these institutes uh, marked. So in the, the uh, front end ASIC design, so we have CEA SACLE, we have IFN Bari, there's AGH in Cracker. Then we have uh, CERN, who developed the GBTs. Um, the GLIBs, MP7s, these have been de 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 designed by CERN and also CMS collaborators. Uh, the AMC is from Boston University, the Micro TCA, we have some development going on there in Wayne State. Then we have uh, the, the hybrid and the board done in Laparanta in Finland, the Opto hybrid in Brussels, and also firmware from Brussels, CERN, and also here in Texas and here. And then also for the, the uh, Texas and you know, of course on the TMB side of the CSCs. So just a few 
closing remarks. So we're all looking forward to going towards this uh, high luminosity phase. We have to do these these upgrades, which is which is very good and very interesting. The gem part is, I think, uh, considered more and more a, uh, a very important part of this uh, evolution. And um, yeah, let's see where this takes us. So what happened to the RPCs? Why, are, why is that not a good vector for the neon chamber? Because there's going to be some smartphone radiation, right? So the main uh, reason for, uh, uh, for us is really resolution. Time? No, position. Position. Yeah, because with this we can get to, I don't know, like 200 micron. And if you put it very close, uh, actually CMS is done in such a way that uh, uh, really the first station gives you more momentum resolution. Because the mills first bend in one direction, and then they bend out. And so like if you look at stations four and three, there is no bend there at all. It's just a confirmation. And uh, all momentum resolution comes from the very first station. And so that's where we want to put gems. You really need the resolution of uh, I don't know, a millimeter or so for the trigger. For offline, you want even better, because uh, then you can do some product and such. But our main issue why it's not RPC is because of they cannot get you know, to this kind of uh, Because they have great timing, like poor position. You want great position, poor timing. Okay. We're not poor timing. I don't know. Like Six nanoseconds nine is not poor timing. So we want to put it in current, correct batch cross, and that's 25 nanoseconds. So it's good enough. Yeah. So after the upgrade, it's still 25 nanoseconds between batch cross? Yeah. Well, they've been scaring us from time to time with 50. No, uh, that's right. uh, but hopefully yeah, it's not going to happen. So it's easier for them to put uh, uh, less bunches, right? You know, like uh, luminosity. It's easier to get high luminosity with less current to get high luminosity uh, with less uh, bunches. And, uh, but then you get end up with a huge pile up so instead of 200 or 400. So all you care about is something went through. You don't care about it's not a calorimetric measurement. All you care about is uh, your position. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's position. Yeah, but we actually uh, for the trigger, what's really important is what uh, Paul has shown about measuring the bending angle between gem and CSC. You can put these two detectors. You we'll turn the old CSC detectors into this new combined uh, double detector, which has large level arm. So see uh, within one chin, one big detector, uh, you can see if it's a high particular or low particular, because that's where the trigger has been starting to close. The reason I'm asking is because there's a new technology coming up, it's uh, using what the electrical engineering department has developed. It's basically the 2D electron dance. It gives you very good position resolution. You can make it in large structures. It's going to be probably a little more expensive than gem, but the amplification you don't need it. And uh, it can give you a very good timing, but nanosecond is good enough. So, uh, what what, what is rates can you take? Radiation, even? Or no, 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 rates, yes. particle rates. Uh, yeah, particle rates. Yeah, particle rates. Kilohertz per centimeter squared? I don't know, but the clearing is very quick. You see, you need a 50 nanosecond clearing, of course, right? There, it's a few nanoseconds. But, but it's, so, it's, but it's, it's just very simple. Very simple. Very good. And uh, so Do we you get enough uh, what's the chances of the great minimization there? Well, you're looking at minimum minor, so it's great. Well, it's great for minimum minor. So our needs for the reason we thought of our AED scale is just for efficiency. So who's the other this? So rusty. Right. So, so we might want to invite him to give a sign that. But we are trying to find applications. This is why I was so excited. Is Gen the final choice or are there other things that you're thinking about? Well, I think you know, here, you know, like a, uh, the inertia, the inertia of this, you know, upgrades.
Jim is always a Jim. So it's too late. <laughs> that's, I, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's the way these, uh, the way it is 10 years. But the way these things work, actually, which is, which is interesting, the way these things work. Because essentially, it's a, it's a bottom metric. You have you have a few people that start working with a particular type of developer, and then they, they work and they gather friends, and they they become bigger and bigger and bigger, and then it's proposed to to, to, to go in, and then it becomes uh, kind of known that this this group has well then they're examined, which we've already gone through these exam these review processes where we're we were used to see if we have the resources, if, if we have the capability and so on to get this in and not cause damage to anybody else. That's yeah, the number one, is really hard. The number one uh, importance is that you don't do any harm. <laughs> and they would also want you to stick it first somewhere else. <laughs> so like what that helped us a lot, you know, like the LHCB was using it already. Uh, they were using, I mean, I think the biggest uh, breakthrough that uh, CMS did in Jazz. We went from this, you know, tiny detectors to being able to build these very large ones. So certainly it was uh, CMS, but CMS simple was behind it. And we really managed to you know, learn how to make this big scale Jazz. And essentially you have, Jazz are of the same generation of as uh, microbials. And in, in Atlas, you have a very similar project, which is called the, the, the small wheel in Atlas. And there they use the cars. Sorry? What is it called? The new small wheel. Small wheel. wheel. Well, the new small wheel. New small wheel. New small wheel. <laughs> but same thing. It's, it's using the microbials. So, but it's doing a very similar 